Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for this event as part of the Harker Speaker Series. My name is Josh Martinez. I'm the chair of visual art at Harker for grades 6 through 12. Uh, this is our third Dickinson Visual Artist Residency. Uh, the goal of the residency is to bring artists from the outside community to work with our students, to do projects, um, and expose them to art and artists that they might not otherwise be connected to. Uh, I would like to thank Pam Dickinson for the generous gift that started the Dickinson Visual Art Endowment, and for all of the other contributors that have helped along the way. Uh, we are very excited to share the work of Pantea Karimi. Uh, Pantea has been here for about a month and has visited the lower, middle, and upper school campuses for workshops with our students. Uh, we have installed the student work in the gallery alongside her work. This is the work from the upper school students. The lower and middle school students will have their work installed on those respective campuses. It has been a great privilege to be able to spend time with Pantea organizing the exhibition and the workshops. Um, she has a deep fascination with the history of science and art, and this is especially focused on how those two disciplines uplift each other. I have prepared questions for Pantea that I hope will illuminate the part of her work that the viewer doesn't usually get to see. Pantea, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. How do you view presentations like this? Are they a part of your practice? Well, now they are. <laughs> Um, no, they have been. They have been part of my practice in a sense that they push me to actually open up and to clarify intentions. So I, I kind of, I have warmed up to these kind of um, interviews or processes as, as such to answer questions, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. Some artists prefer to let their work be experienced without too much of a look into the process. Um, do you think creating a conversation about the background and the research um, allows the audience to experience it more fully? I think so. In my opinion, it's, it's important to sometimes know what happens in the backstage. And um, I usually do it for the curious viewer mm -hmm. anyway. So if someone is curious, then they will get some answers. <laughs> yeah. um, as, as we set the scene for tonight, um, we'll talk about the intersection mm -hmm. of art and science. Um, do you find that scientists and artists speak about your work in different terms? Um, yeah, different terms for sure. I think scientists would most probably enjoy the scholarship I put into the work, and artists um, not only enjoy the scholarship, but also the emotional and the technical and the visual aspects of my work. Um, that would be like a wholesome discussion, so to speak, with artists, usually, yeah. Um, during the course of this evening and, and this audience, um, how would you like them to approach this interview? What do you think, what utility do you think it has? Um, perhaps I would, I would want them to know that there are more um, to my work than what the visual portrays. And um, because of the questions um, you have prepared, um, I might just even answer some of them and have a bit more of a psychological response, not not only just research or fascination with the research or um, the emotional. Some of my psychological responses might come up too tonight. Yeah. And so much of your experience is in that work. It, I would, that would make sense if that happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I would like to talk to you about um, your experience at the Harker School mm -hmm. first. Oh, yeah. Um, you did workshops with our students uh, at every level. Mm -hmm. um, and you designed a project that was based on a late medieval Iranian document, mm -hmm. the Topkapi Scroll, um, which is housed at Topkapi Library in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it, was, it recorded geometrical designs and tiling patterns from mm -hmm. architecture um, and contains geometric texts, which are in the form of pixels. Yes. Um, how did you arrive at that concept that you asked our students to explore? Um, first, I would like to mention that uh, the top copy scroll, which is on this uh, slide, actually, um, it's a, a scroll that um, contains a lot of these uh, designs that you mentioned, and is one of the best examples of the interconnectivity of science and art from late medieval Iran. So it is an important document to present and to work from, uh, to begin with. 
But at Harker School Residency, my task was to design a curriculum that worked for all age groups from kindergarten to, to, uh, through 12th grade. And um, the, the process was also supposed to be based on the top copy scroll and my own work process. So I had a lot of different considerations um, in, in the designing the curriculum. But then uh, for the content, um, I came up with the idea of the, uh, students design uh, stars in a pixel form uh, using the square grid. And I thought uh, stars are the most you know, known um, astronomical elements, but yet their shapes are open to um, interpretation. So I thought the students would use their creative imagination and just create different you know, star designs that they're all stars, but they're all different, which I really wanted. Um, and then pixel, right? Pixel is a very known term, and especially to young students because they play games, and there are a lot of games such as Minecraft that are based on these pixels. So I thought that would be appealing to some of the young students as well. Some of them mentioned that. <laughs> oh, that's good <laughs> to know. <laughs> um, they all loved this project. It, mm. it was wonderful at every level, and it was so cool to have you come today and look at the, the work that yeah, they Yeah, that was it. the first time I actually saw the um, finished um, projects, yeah. yeah. It was so surprising, the <laughs> variety of each star. I, yeah. When you were in my photography class, um, they were working on their pixel grids, and you and I took a photograph from the James Webb Telescope Yes. and zoomed in all the way until you could see the pixel structure. Absolutely. And it was just so magical. <clears throat> moment yeah it's i actually amazing. yeah these are these are the buildings that use all those pixel tiles and then um the one that you're referring to yes. is this one is. yeah um, when i was in your classroom and we were talking about you know how students should do the design you zoomed in and um, it was a magical moment to see the pixelated star that has all these variations of colors so it was really inspiring to see that i remember that <laughs> Yeah, I, I went yeah. back and I did it a few more times just, just for fun, just to see them sort of abstract. It was mm -hmm. amazing. Um, you are a teacher. Yeah. And um, a teacher and an artist at the same time. And, and I'm wondering how does teaching influence and inform your artistic process? Um, it opens up my brain in a different way because in order to teach, I need to dig deeper. I need to know my, my subject really, really well, and I need to be able to narrow it down if I need to. So I think it's a, it's a very helpful process in that sense. I get closer to my subject matter, so to speak. Yeah. I feel that as mm -hmm. well, yeah. Um, do, do you see your students' ideas um, strengthening or otherwise contributing to yours? When I design these kind of uh, curricula, I, I'm not really focused on that. I'm more interested in how students respond to these historic and archival materials. That's, that's even more intriguing for me. So yeah, that's, that's the focus, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, do you want to share any memorable moments of working with our <laughs> students at Harker? Well, yes. Um, I, I just here want to say that how much I enjoyed working with the students at Harker. Um, the, the star designs they created are just mind-blowing and, and so free and so beautiful. They all shone like stars, pun intended here. But as a teacher, um, I have to say that they are also among the best the students I've taught. But answering your questions, I was at the Lord School at Harker, and after I finished my teaching, um, one of the students, grade three to five they were, one of the students came to me and said, can I have your signature? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I first, I didn't understand it. And then um, a few other students followed, followed that first student and said, yeah, we want your signature too. So they treated me like a celebrity. That was so sweet. And then um, one of the other best moments that I clearly remember is when I was assigned to do a critique session with the upper school students, the high schoolers, um, I was stunned by how deeply they explored their subject matters and they executed all of these subjects in different various media. They also presented um, 
the, their ideas to me very thoughtfully for me to give them feedback because I told you to just give them only one minute. In one minute, tell me everything, you know, and then they did. It was re really cohesive. So that was really beautiful to also observe how young they are and how deep they think about what they are passionate um, about, yeah. Yeah, that, that surprises me every day. They're, they are really <laughs> amazing. Um, would you like to share anything about the teachers that you worked with here as well? Well, in one word, excellent. Um, I think the, um, the art teachers at Harker are informed, knowledgeable, with uh, technical aptitude. And since my task was to design a project that worked for kindergarten through grade you know, 12, um, I had to work with different media and different teachers, but they made me really, really comfortable, just, you know, kind of like a smooth process into the um, teaching, you know, sessions. And the result, uh, some of them are on the wall, <laughs> what the students did. And just for the audience, I designed um, the project and students did the first part with me um, working on their pixel stars on paper, a square grid papers. And after that, it was in the hands of the Harker School teachers to transform them into um, ceramics. Your students did digital um, pixel stars. And um, another teacher worked with them to create monotype uh, prints. So it was very diverse and beautifully done. We really enjoyed having you. Thank you. Um, we'd love to dig a little deeper into the works in the exhibition okay. in your show here. Mm -hmm. um, the title of the show is Context Lost, um, and I've enjoyed seeing ancient forms and histories that you've mm -hmm. represented um, to create contemporary conversations. As you interacted with these histories and applied different lenses, how does your perception and relationship to the original context shift? Mm. That's a very good question because, um, you know, my compulsion to explore the past um, is, is an investigation of my identity that simultaneously like celebrates and protests my cultural heritage and my life experiences. But I have to say that the process of researching all of these archival materials somehow is therapeutic. It acts as if there is a, uh, I'm guided by a therapist that helps me to ponder and to kind of reflect over current issues and put it into perspective. It honestly feels like that. Um, but then, you know, over the years, um, I have been able to narrow down the context and the content and focus it more on the issues that I care about and things that I want to highlight. So now the works that I've been doing is around not only my personal stories, but also um, the works highlight these uh, scientific and um, cultural and historic you know, archival materials and often put into social political contexts. I love that you're blending the personal mm -hmm. and the historical. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of another work that that you made um, that we have exhibited here, your marbling prints um, that include images and references to the saffron crocus. Mm -hmm. um, I visited your exhibition, um, Saffron Saint of Spices at the Triton Museum. Um, I think it was last spring when we, we first started working together. That's right. Um, and I was struck by how you depicted a medicinal plant as a divine being. Um, and you were also the artist in residence at uh, University of California, San Francisco Library uh, in 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, it ended in 2022. And it ended in 2022. Yeah, it was one year. For one year. Mm -hmm. um, you were researching medicinal botany. Uh, and it, as you researched medicinal plants, what was it about the saffron crocus that made you want to celebrate it in the way that you did? Yeah, saffron crocus is a plant, it's a flower that is, a, is an important element in Iranian cuisine, economy, and um, you know, medicinal, herbal um, kind of... Uh, entities f for centuries in Iran. Uh, saffron crocus is a beautiful flower and it's a difficult flower. Um, for one kilogram of saffron, 150,000 flowers must be hand-picked. 
<laughs> this is mind blowing. <laughs> also, Iran is um, one of is ninety percent of the saffron is cultivated in Iran. The saffron in the world is cultivated in Iran. Uh, so my exhibition at the Triton Museum was basically the celebration of saffron as a cultural symbol, but I put it into a divine entity. I made my saffron a saint uh, because saffron has this healing power, like how saints um, were described in religious texts. <laughs> That's totally. basically how it happened, yeah. In that show too, there, there's a video of the crocus being harvested. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I remember the, the ground is, is so cracked and dry and, and the, these very fragile <coughs> flowers are growing out of it. Yeah. Um, that seems to add to that as well. Absolutely, this. because um, it grows in a very um, kind of like um, cold climate, I would say, and they have to be hand-picked. Um, sometime, like, you know, farmers have four weeks a late October to November time, which is also very cold. Um, it's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing flower and the climate that it needs and it must be hand-picked and all of, all of that attributes make it a very important flower to celebrate. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, your, your piece, the, the other piece in the show um, in the center of the gallery, Haram Pascal, mm. um, was originally a site-specific work for the Felt Factory Gallery in San Francisco, um, and then it was later installed at MIT's Roch Library of Architecture and Planning, mm -hmm. um, along with a few other places. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about the background and the inspiration for that work? Yeah, this is the first um, mathematical artworks I made in my math series, and uh, so it's very close to me in that sense. Um, it is based on uh, Pascal triangle and binomial numbers that form this triangle shape of infinite numbers. So the triangles can continue forever if I choose to. Um, so the binomial numbers were um, proved by uh, Pascal in the 17th century, but uh, Omar Khayyam, the poet and the mathematician, in Iran assumed these numbers in the 12th century, centuries before Pascal. Actually, in Iran, we call it uh, Khayyam uh, Triangle, <laughs> not Pascal. So um, creating this work, I wanted to pay homage to both mathematicians. And the uh, installation at Harker uses over 260 hand-cut felt triangles that I screen printed binomial numbers on them. And um, they are really like um, becoming an animated, you know, kind of um, little moment, you know, when you're looking at them because of the colors and the numbers that are there. That aspect of it also was very enchanting for me in that sense. And it's monumental scale as well. Yes, that one at Harker, I think is around nine feet. Mm -hmm. But I've done 16 feet in other galleries and other kind of formations of it I've done as well. As you can see on the slide um, uh, at the MIT, I created a longer version of them, yeah. Do you consider Khayyam to be a saint similar to Saffron? <laughs> no, no, Omar Khayyam cannot be a saint. And there is a reason for it because it's not exciting to me to make him a saint. But then saffron crocus is a saint because it's more intriguing and it's more interesting, it's unexpected. But then saffron has this healing power, like, um, as I said, like saints. And another reason is that Omar Khayyam is dead, but saffron crocus lives on because nature lives on and the healing properties of nature keeps, you know, you know kind of like informing us about our body and mind and everything else. So, yeah, saffron certainly is the saint <laughs> here. Um, the third section of your show, Artful mm. Attacks, um, references the top copy scroll mm. and an old script format, square kufik. Um, it utilizes a grid structure uh, and again, the pixel. Uh, what was it about the script and its origins that made it ideal for you to create commentary in, on contemporary politics surrounding Iran? Yeah, the top copy scroll um, includes all of these beautiful tile designs in pixel formats, and these tile designs were used um, 
on medieval structures uh, from early 14th century in Natanz, which is a city near Isfahan. Natanz is a historic city. But then the Iranian government's nuclear site is very, very close to Natanz. And it was attacked in 2022, 2020 and 2021. Mm -hmm. And um, once I heard the news, um, I wanted to do something about it. And I made the Artful Attack series because of that. Because to me, first of all, the attacks put all of these beautiful medieval structures in danger. That's for sure. And then another thing was that such incidents immediately takes these, you know, uh, scientific and beautiful cultural heritage out of their historical identity. And instead, they, they put them into this contemporary political identity that is not what they are assigned to. So that was the reason I actually made the Artful Attack series to begin with, yeah. And, and it continues, yeah, it's just going. And what do you see as being lost when that uh, identity shift takes place? Everything. I think the essence of these beautiful cultural <laughs> heritage and their beauty and what they, are, what they mean to present, they all get lost in translation when they are assigned a political identity, yeah. Great. Um, I wanted to show one of the larger botanical chandeliers that you had made from your series, Suspended Healing Garden, um, as well as the very long scroll from the Artful Attack series. Um, but we couldn't because of fire code and, and the number of other things um, that with the building. Um, and I, I'm curious, how did the space constraints shape your works in the exhibition and, and what came out of that conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, on the slide, um, there is the chandelier that you wanted to be actually installed in the lobby. And then the 42 feet of the scroll uh, would have been in the exhibition as well. Um, um, sometimes reinstalling my works in new spaces, yeah, give me all these big challenges, but then sometimes the process brings uh, surprising results. I think in the case of Harker, it created a conversation between you and I, like creates more dialogues around it, and we decided to kind of show snippets of various series from my math and botanical uh, series and um, the the whole context shifted, <laughs> <laughs> and then the whole dialogues were created around the new works that we reconsidered in the space. Yeah. Plus, you made an animation, which is yeah, very and then beautiful. I made an animation for the LED because we couldn't do the chandelier in the lobby. Then instead, the animation was created and it fits really well, I must say. <laughs> it does, I, I think it's lovely, it's amazing. <laughs> um, so the, most of your work actually um, in this exhibition comes mm -hmm. from previous exhibitions and residencies that you've had. Um, how does interacting with institutions factor into your research and process when you're creating work? Um, yeah, it's, it's very important for me um, to be in a new environment, like um, d getting these residencies either for research or for artistic processes are all very eye-opening. Um, each institution has a different environment that makes me interact with their archives or their materials or just the program they provide differently. And sometimes I arrive at a very surprising moment. Um, an example of it is my Mass Mocha Artist Residency back in 2022. Mass Mocha is one of the biggest um, museums of contemporary art in North Adams, Massachusetts. And there I'm in front of 27,000 square uh, foot of uh, Saul Lewitt's uh, geometric wall designs and wall murals. It was quite a moment um, to look at everything in one place. And that um, kind of experience was quite surprising in a sense that for the first time I realized I did not see geometry as Saul Lewitt did. 
my geometry and my perception of the geometry was very different. I started thinking about it and I realized that it was due to growing up under theocracy in Iran. Studying science um, was a lot through the lens of religion. And um, at that moment, I decided to make um, an artwork that talked about this psychological kind of like encounter. I created a series of videos in front of Saul Lewitt's um, star uh, mural. And the stars, interestingly enough, are similar to those that are um, included in the top copy scroll. Mm -hmm. And these videos, I reject geometry, specifically the shape cube. Since then, uh, my past experiences and psychological approach to my work has been coming to my work process in a, in a more complex way. So I, I would say, yeah, it is very important to be in an artist's residency. It's a, it's a good change to realize more about the process. It allows you to be surprised by the format. Surprised, and, uh, angry, <laughs> um, kind of like confused, lost. All of it happened to me when I was at, at Mass Mocha. And um, the series I created is called Cube is Not Geometric. And that, um, within that work, the Cube is Not Geometric, you put a star from the top copy scroll at the, yes. the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> This feels like a great time to talk about your background a little bit. Um, you studied science and fine art during your high school years in Iran. Mm -hmm. um, how was that experience to have both topics as part of your education viewed equally rigorously? Yeah, the, the influence of art, science, and history are all um, because of my parents. Um, my father is a mathematician and architect. Of course, he's retired now. And my mother is a retired history teacher. They both um, pushed for these topics. Plus, my mother comes from generations of herbal lovers, and um, that was also very important for her to kind of put the seeds um, uh, in my brain. Um, but then studying science and art uh, simultaneously was extremely challenging and difficult, contrasting yet magical. Because um, in the morning, six days a week, because Iran has only one day as weekend, so you go to school six days a week. Uh, I studied science, and four days in the afternoon, I studied uh, art. And it was the academic year and also summer. <laughs> um, but I'm very thankful to my parents that created such an intense program for me because and especially my mother, because she also paid for the art course uh, tuitions, the extra tuitions she had to pay. Because it, it opened up my, my eyes to both fields together, so I could compare and contrast my likings. And, and it gave me choices, because by the time I arrived um, at the point that I had to submit you know, applications for universities, I knew my destiny. I was going to become a designer and artist. So I um, studied graphic design in Iran, and during that time, I familiarized myself with all the um, beautiful Iranian crafts and printmaking techniques. And all of these are part of my work to this date, but yet, um, Still to this date, I'm so grateful that I was exposed to both science and art at the same time because now my work is at the intersection of art and science and this is the most I've enjoyed making art, I must say. Yeah, you've built an entire practice on, on the relationship between these two things. Mm -hmm. um, what similarities do you see between them? Yeah, um, you know, um, I really, really work hard to show how much art contributed to the science and show that in my work. I really try to highlight that. But then um, just focusing on both um, fields, I see similarities between the discovery processes. 
both art and science um, use exploration, visually and conceptually. They share this amazing moment that is um, involved imagination. And then both they communicate meaning. Since I have started at the intersection of the two fields and my work is an integration of, the, of both fields, it has elevated my inner awareness about um, how we communicate and how many different forms this communication takes, basically, and we should be open. That is, that is what I really, really learned. <laughs> there, there's this great passage from um, Rebecca Sohn, it's a field mm -hmm. guide to getting lost. Um, she says that scientists haul in the truth like fishermen, but it's artists that get you out into the dark sea. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> um, I love that you're promoting a conversation between the, these two disciplines that often get separated, and I think that's especially true at a school like Harker. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give to students who carry these simultaneous interests? Um, I would say um, pay attention to your core interest, to your talent, see which side is heavier. <laughs> and um, I believe that what takes someone move forward successfully is passion, talent, and core interest. So once a student knows which one, I think on, they are on the right track. For me, it was art and design at the end. Wonderful. Yeah. We're so glad you chose that. <laughs> um, you grew up in Iran mm -hmm. and emigrated to England first in your 20s and then to the United States a few years later. Mm -hmm. Um, what experiences in Iran as a child influenced your work and how has that transition affected the type of work that you make? Again, we go back to my parents because um, they took my sister and I to botanical gardens, to all these beautiful architectural spaces um, and um, beautiful like monuments to visit and to see. Um, I remember that every time I was in some of these um, architectural places, I had this sense of awe and wonder. I was fascinated by the tiles, by the designs, and a lot of my interest that I have now in my work comes from my childhood experiences, and I bring those stories to my work. However, the social political context that my work presents um, is um, because I immigrated. It was then that I saw all the issues outside in. It was an interesting kind of moment. Since um, I have moved out of Iran as an immigrant, I cannot help it but bringing these political issues to my work, and they have been the most intense processes for me to actually observe it from outside in. Um, many of the histories, objects, and artifacts that you are researching or building works from, mm -hmm. um, ha they have religious roots. Um, in many ways, you are responding to or refocusing that energy into something secular. Mm -hmm. um, but it feels more than that, as if science and art are being celebrated as divine. Um, independent of structured religion, as an atheist, how do you approach the religious aspects of your inspirational sources? This is another great question. Um, I would say growing up under theocracy in Iran and being subjected to compulsory religious beliefs did, did nothing for me. It only distanced me from religion. But as an artist, um, I had an observation about religious aesthetic. It's beautiful. To me, uh, religion uses art to appeal to masses. And religion uses art at the highest intricacy to kind of, uh, you know, um, praise these deities and, and saints. All these books and objects and uh, structures that we observe, they are made beautifully to, to do such a, you know, good job. So in my art, I decouple art from religion. I use the aesthetic religion uh, portrays, which is simply art. So I use the art side of it. And it's, a, it's also, I use it as a beautiful moment to be able to tell a story 
and put these scientific subjects or cultural subjects or other contemporary subjects I've done into this divine moment. They deserve it. <laughs> is, is this another moment that you consider to be context lost? Actually, in this case, I would say context is found in the right manner <laughs> <laughs> because um, religions can use the aesthetic if, I mean, they continue doing it, it's beautiful, that's fine. But for me, I use that idea to kind of bring, you know, for instance, you know, saffron crocus or um, women, contemporary women who are requesting their bodily autonomy or other rights, they put, I put them into this divine moment. And th these are what I care about. And that's how I see it, you know, basically. Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, well, this is a great chance for us to talk a little bit about your work specifically, um, your process. Mm -hmm. uh, you used mixed media from marbling paintings to 3D mm -hmm. printing to original prints mm -hmm. and monotypes. Um, can you tell me more about these mediums and why you chose to imagine your works through the various mediums? Yeah, um, well, I, I usually work on paper, um, but then interpretation of these scientific ideas in a dynamic way sometimes requires me to get out of paper and to create um, all these objects, such as the one that I created a triptych that celebrates saffron, or I sometimes work on fabric uh, after religious you know, banners, then it has to be fabric to celebrate, for instance, the bravery of Iranian women. And then um, I'm not a sculptor, suddenly I find myself that I have to perceive cube in a different way, and then a cube has to be made. And then um, there are moments that um, I want to bring my childhood experiences to the work, such as um, this artwork that is called Folding Gardens and Stained Memory. It's the story of my childhood perception of a botanical garden, that how the trees were tall compared to my height, so the installation is 10 feet high, and I created the installation using um, the 12th century medicinal uh, botanicals images, and I digitally illustrated them on these fabric pieces. Then in the exhibition, I asked um, the viewers, the gallery goers, to go among the fabric pieces as if they were walking into a botanical garden. And then um, on this slide, I also have another example of um, um, uh, the unbearable uh, lightness of mathematics, an exhibition that I created based on my childhood memory of my science school and the mathematic, mathematics class. And um, I created all these mathematical formulas with white chalk on black paper that looked like blackboards. Um, so all of these moments need to get out of me, and sometimes I need to kind of consider other materials. I feel that in your work, <coughs> excuse me, um, that there, there's a, like an urgency to the material, that it, it needs to be made out of that particular thing. Yeah, that's the right reading. It is urgent for me. And sometimes people say, oh, there are different materials, or the, the, the look is somehow different. But I somehow keep the color palette very kind of like <laughs> down to earth, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, they're not as colorful um, um, as usually they are within my, for instance, marbling prints. Marbling prints are the most colorful works I, I make. Um, yeah, it's, it's an urgency. It has, to, it, has to, it has to be done. It is what it is, yeah. <laughs> so to yeah. speak, yeah. Um, so much of your work is, is based on research, um, and you've gotten to go into some very restricted collections and touch some off-limit items and ancient manuscripts and objects. Um, these are places that usually researchers from other disciplines get to go, but not generally artists. Mm -hmm. um, what is it like being an artist in those environments? Intimidating, because I'm not a trained historian. <laughs> but I think... Um, Gradually, I, I learned how to do research and become better at it. Um, and also, um, I'm very passionate about these historical materials. I'm, I'm, I'm just in love with all of them. And I think this passion and love I have for them 
um, it's very evident when I go to an institution and the usually the library staff members just really respond mm -hmm. to that passion I have for these archival materials. But then um, I'm also grateful to my sister, who is a scholar and uh, hi uh, architecture historian. And she paved the path for me and she showed me methods when I started working on this uh, project back in 2014. So it's almost 10 years. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Um, do you want to share any memorable experiences about getting to see these collections? Yeah, at the British Library in 2018, for the first time I touched Galileo's handwriting and his signature. That was magical. And I also saw his crooked, lovely drawings. They were on the slide. <laughs> he uh, recorded his observations of the moon after he made the telescope, and he drew them. That's just, that's just magical to begin with. At the MIT library, I touched the smallest book in the world, uh, which is half a size of a stamp. It is also on the slide. And that book is also just uh, represents Galileo and his letters to his friend about religion and science. And then the first time I touched uh, Vouvelles, and Vouvelles are astronomical paper, astronomical gadgets that were installed inside scientific manuscripts. They calculated celestial problems. They were interactive. And they gave another dimension to the scientific manuscripts because they were designed uh, with a lot of beautiful calligraphic you know, numbers, and they had a lot of intricate designs on them. And the first time I touched one and I rotated it, um, it was really magical. And then last but not least, seeing one of the best medicinal botanical books and manuscripts that were created as part of world heritage, not only Iran, but world heritage. Um, it's been absolutely magical. and like, I don't know, surprising that I've, I found myself in those moments. I never, I never imagined, but it happened. <laughs> I can only imagine even that tiny book must have so much gravity, like, <laughs> it just feels Well, amazing. at the MIT library, they gave me um, um, a lot of tools to actually be able to observe and look and also page it. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it was really wonderful to interact with it. That's amazing. Um, this is our last question. Um, oh. How do you want viewers to understand the integration of art and science um, and the connection that you maintain in your work as they go back out and look at your show tonight? Um, yeah, okay. Um, this is a very good question because we have to understand that how much of early science was involved with art and how much scientists back then relied on art to actually convey meaning and to open up to the audience with visuals to just you know, archive their research. A great example of, of such work is um, the diagrams, the prism diagram by Isaac Newton. Mm. When he was researching this prism, uh, he drew the whole process. That became such a big, big diagram to cherish at the time. And then, um, so these early scientific manuscripts and ideas relied on art. So there are a lot of beautiful kind of examples that I use as source of inspiration to create my installations or some of the kind of forms within my works come from them. And in every exhibition, in my statements or on the labels, I reference everything. I want people to know where they are coming from and how I interpreted them. But then, to answer precisely your question, um, I have to say that I invite the viewer to observe the integration of art and science in my work, not only uh, that you know, they observe my personal stories, but also to observe how that integration has enabled me to reveal these archival materials and then also be able to put them in social political context and also reveal that side of 
you know, my experiences as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for being with us tonight and for sharing your work and your process. It means so much that you're willing to share thank that. Um, I'm sure that many audience members have questions, um, but in, in lieu of a question and answer session on stage, you've invited everyone in the audience to stay for a few minutes afterwards um, and have a refreshment and ask in a more informal setting, a small group or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say before we close? Yes, I want to just express my gratitude to you for this interview and all the great questions you asked me. Also to Pamela Dickinson for this artist residency and the whole artist residency team. <laughs> and last but not least, my deepest gratitude to all the students who worked with me and all the amazing Harker School uh, teachers. Uh, who worked with me in the past few months in this process. I'm very, very grateful and I really enjoyed my experience. Thank you. Thank you. We loved having you. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, please join us in the lobby. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>